Welcome to another Good Dads podcast. I am Jay Foch alongside Dr. Jennifer Baker, and we have some special guests via Zoom right now. Yeah. So uh, on my left is Jeremiah Penrod. Would you, Jeremiah, tell us, um, you know, a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, I'm, I am a uh, an account manager, tire sales um, person for a uh, commercial tire uh store here in um, Stratford, Missouri. It's called Pomps Tire Service. We're based out of uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, we have over 160 some odd stores and we work with uh, trucking companies to help manage their fleet and their um, tire expenses on that end and we get into some mechanical and other things. Well in a minute we're going to ask you a little bit about how you got to be where you are because you had a rather interesting path to where you are. But then right below you is uh, Jim Chowry. Jim, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do? Well, um, I, I retired a year and a half ago, but I, it lasted two weeks. I'm on my third career. Um, <laughs> I, I can't really stop, man. For, uh, <laughs> five or six years because I owned a trucking company and uh, Jeremiah has taken real good care of me as a, as a tire salesman and uh, and then uh, we've remained friends since that time. So it's, I'm glad to see him on this uh, podcast and, and to work with him. But uh, currently, I, um, I've been developing a small resort and cabins down at Table Rock Lake. And uh, it was a good excuse for me to be able to have a boat and get to the lake. And uh, my wife thinks I'm working. It's all good. <laughs> So we're just thinking that this is the time of year when a lot of dads are saying to their kids, so, uh, especially if they're about a senior in high school, so what do you think you're going to be doing next year at this time? So like, you know, what plans do you have beyond your senior year in high school? Um, and so what we want you to do, first of all, is tell us when you were 16, 17 years old, you can think back that far. Um, what were you thinking you were going to be doing with your life? Okay. Uh, well, uh, when I was 16, 17, I uh, was dating my beautiful wife, Ashley. Um, and uh, at that point in my life, I knew I wanted to I have kind of a servant's heart. I really wanted to help people. And uh, at that point, I wanted to go into uh, psychology and went to Missouri Valley College in Marshall, Missouri. Um, and got my bachelor's degree there and that. Uh, and then I actually worked with uh, Dr. Baker, or not worked with, but she was a director of our program there at uh, Forest Institute. And uh, it, it, that's kind of how that progressed, I guess, before I get too long-winded. So you thought you thought you were going to be working, not in tire sales, but you thought exactly. you were going to be working in psychology and marriage and family therapy in particular, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so Jim, how about you? You know, it seems like I've been working all my life. I, uh, I think I had my first paper out when I was nine years old. Um, my dad worked two and three jobs the whole time I was growing up. He owned real estate and apartments, and I painted every weekend with him and mowed lawns and um, did everything he needed to do. We were our own maintenance people. Uh, during high school, when I was 15 and 16, I worked in a gas station every weekend. Friday nights and Saturday and Saturday nights, I worked in a gas station. And I remember selling my Target rifle my aunt shoots target rifles on the rifle team for $300, and I bought my first Volkswagen the day I turned 16 for $300. And, uh, you know, then then I could, uh, at that time, gasoline was 30, I'm going to date myself here, gasoline was 3 <laughs> cents a gallon, cheeseburgers were 30 cents. And, you know, I'd work all weekend, and I'd fill up my gas tank and get a couple cheeseburgers, and life was good. So, uh, my dad always had the expectation that... Tell that, me another story, Grandpa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my dad always had the expectation we go to college and and uh the other four kids i'm the only one that's received a diploma and i got a diploma in uh, uh business and degree in finance and um cum laude degree in finance and and i always wanted to own my own business and so i worked towards that goal of trying to do that and now i'm on my third uh, i guess serial entrepreneurship uh career of owning my own resort so i've I uh, worked as a painter. I've worked as a carpenter. Um, I got into roofing, and then I started selling roofing materials. Then I owned my own roofing supply business. And when I sold that, I had non-compete, and I got into the trucking business. Boy, what a mistake that was, Jeremiah. So, um, <laughs> it took a lot of years to get well, out. 
Put in your time. The best of luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when you were 16 or 17, you had this thought about, I want to be in business, but you didn't really know what kind of business you were going to be in. No, I didn't, you know, and, and I will tell you, I think it, it's wrong for any kid of 16 or 17 to think they're going to know where their career is going to take them at that point. And, you know, I think if you just go to work, find a job, go to work and, and learn good work ethic, learn to show up on time, learn to be productive during your time there and not just stare at your phone and text your friends while you're expecting a paycheck that, uh, you know, you can go a long, long way. And, and, and life throws a lot of curves at you. And I think Jay, you and Jennifer and Jeremy, I know you could all tell the same stories that did you plan your life to be the where it is today? Absolutely not. Yeah. No, I would have done something different. <laughs> no, that's for sure. <laughs> I had hey Jim, I had dreams too, but this is this is where I ended up. So <laughs> well, I had a note actually. I'm a little to tell more you. enthusiastic about that with that good good dad sign behind. I'm not talking about good dads. I'm talking about my radio career, not this. This is wonderful. <laughs> Jay, I wanted to go directly from college to retirement, but there was Did a forty-year gap in the middle. Right. Well, here you, you are. You're retirement. And you're still working, Jim. Now, what's wrong with that? Yeah, retirement's not what it's cracked up to be. <laughs> so now, I want you guys to uh, reflect on the statement. So I see a fair number of college students, and they come in, and they believe in this, I'm just going to call it myth or fantasy, that if you choose the right profession, you will never work a day in your life. I don't know whoever said that, but, you know, what do you guys think about that? Jeremiah? Oh, well, uh, yeah, no, it, it, everything requires some, some amount of flexibility and, oh my gosh, empathy toward others. And I don't, I don't know who made that up. <laughs> Jim? I think that you're going to work at a job regardless of what, I love what I did. I love, uh, I've loved all the careers I've had. I've put my whole heart and soul into it. I'm a hard worker, but there are days when it's just labor. It's just yeah. manual labor, and you have to drag yourself out of bed and go to work with a hangover and <laughs> suffer through. <laughs> I, think most of all, I think most of all I enjoy working with the people. Though. I mean, that, that kind of helps. It's, it's all about who you surround yourself with, I suppose. And I've really enjoyed working with Jim and, and Jennifer and Foch, I guess I've met you at a couple games. <laughs> you don't want to work with me, Jeremiah. It's, 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 you're better off. <laughs> I think the point is that there are enjoyable things about, you know, every job probably or most jobs, but there are also some things that you don't like. Like we've talked to some teachers today, grading papers and dealing with some parents is going to administrative meetings. Those aren't really fun things to do usually. And we just talked to a couple of military guys and they both admitted there were, you know, the, one of the things about being successful in the military is you have to accustom yourself to doing some things you don't like to do. So. I will tell you this about the military. My best employees are ex-military. And, and because they learn uh, that they have a place in an organization, okay? If you're a corporal, you can't be the commander, okay? You are a corporal, you're gonna do the grunt work. You know, uh, and, and as you rise in rank, you get more responsibility and you have more control of your destiny and your people. And, and so my truck drivers, the ones that were ex-military, were, were the best because they were very reliable, because they knew their position was a truck driver. They weren't the commander. They weren't the president of the corporation. And therefore, they knew what their role was within the organization. And so a lot of people struggle with that. Wouldn't you say, Dr. Baker? Yes, I would say that uh, people may think they know. Well, even the, uh, the we had one professor and one teacher on and uh, Miner said, well, one of the difficulties is that everybody's been to school. So everybody thinks that they know how to do school because they've spent so much time there, even though they would never, because they've sat into a doctor's waiting room, they would never tell the doctor how to do it you know, because they've sat in the waiting room and been to see a doctor, but they often think they can tell a teacher how to do it. And that's challenging, but, you know, that's a part of it. So yeah, I think knowing your place and respecting the people 
who you know are doing who know more about the job than maybe you do not that your opinion is not valuable but it's certainly well, for young people that are just entering the workforce it's important for them to understand that just because they've been there three days doesn't mean they have the ear of the president right yes <laughs> very true so it sounds like in both your cases your parents instilled a good work ethic which helped and then there was also the expectation that you would go to college did your how did they influence you in terms of what you studied um honestly my parents they didn't i don't think they expected me to go to college i was always told i was smart and i should but uh, i mean i i grew up working on a farm a, a family friend's farm and uh i mean i guess that was part of it that in family you know that instilled that work ethic but I, you know, I just, I knew that in order to, it was just kind of the the, uh, the, the time, that I guess, in society, it was going to be expected that that's how I would be able to help people as far as, you know, an education would be required. I didn't really have any expectations by family members, I guess, if that would do that into your question, I guess. Yeah, I think in part, I mean, that you're, what your parents said was they encouraged you. I mean, they said basically you could be successful in college, so you should go to college. Yeah. So how did you, I just got to ask, how did you end up with selling tires then? How did you make that switch? It, uh, it, it helped me combine, uh, I was having to do three, two or three jobs, and in the process of helping other marriages and families succeed, it was causing a strain on my own. So I, it was kind of a... In my own mind, it was a necessity, but in other ways, it was kind of a path that I didn't see. I didn't see how I could help other people, I guess, you know, going going forward into uh, commercial tires. Uh, but, you know, I guess people have been put in my path um, that God saw fit, I guess. Um, so in that way, I was able to um, to use where I'm at to, to further that cause. But, yeah, it, it was more of a necessity, I guess. What I think is really cool about that is sometimes life hands us a direction we didn't think that we were going to go in. And then we find that in that direction, in that role, we can actually help people a lot more than we thought we could just because of the relationships that we build. And mm -hmm. some doors are open that never would have been opened had we not had that opportunity. So. You know, Jennifer, I'd like to add too that in, in Jeremiah's case, he was able to get a good paying job yes. out of the field that you, your field pays terrible. <laughs> Just, <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm not trying to recruit students, so yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> for, for your listeners, you know, it's important they know that in the industrial world, even if you don't have a degree, you know, and Jeremiah has a degree, but not in what he's doing. You don't get a degree in yeah. tireology. Uh, uh, but, but, <laughs> Industrial work, industrial sales can pay fantastic. I mean, there are people that make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year selling paint and concrete additives and chemicals and construction materials. And so you don't have to own your own business to make that kind of money. Um, there's, and, and I mean, there's not jobs everywhere, but, but earn your stripes, right? You, I mean, you start off maybe in a warehouse driving a forklift for a company, and then you get elevated to a sales position after a couple of years, it's kind of the track I took. And uh, and then, you know, you make the most of it. And so uh, you don't have to have a college education necessarily to make a really good living uh, in the industrial world, especially in the Midwest or, you know, really anywhere. So. I think then that's one of the reasons we wanted to have you guys both on today, because Jim, you've done a lot of different things and you're um, skilled in various trades you work with people in the trades and what we want people to know is you don't have to have a college degree to be successful it may be helpful in some ways but it's not essential uh in a lot of areas so and you, where were you at dr baker whenever i was trying to argue with my parents about going to college <laughs> I wish I could have just picked up the phone and been like, you know what? Here you go, mom and dad. How about that? Hey, do you see yourself in plumbing, Jay? Okay. Yeah. I, I, actually, I would love to be in plumbing. Yes. Well, there you go. <laughs> I, you know what? That It might not be too late. I, I could right. still do it. <laughs> so, Jim, can yeah, you I'll tell you, all the construction trades right now are struggling. You know, construction is booming in you know, just booming in, in Southwest Missouri and, 
and all the construction trades are struggling. Other it's think about it from and, and building a house from the foundation, a concrete guy, and then you've got a framer, framing crews, carpentry work, then you've got the plumbers, the electricians, heating and air conditioning guys, the insulation installers, the finished carpenters, the roofers, the drywallers, all those trades, those people are, you know, they talk about wages being 12, 13, $14 in Springfield. They're not in the construction trades. Those people are making $20 an hour, $24 an hour, $25 an hour. It's work, it's labor. You go to work every day, but you can make a really good living doing that right now. Yeah. And in some areas of that, you're, I wouldn't say you're totally recession proof, but there are some areas where there's still work, even if there are difficult financial times, just because of the nature, your skill level is such that it's hard to find people with those skills. I think welding is one of those areas, isn't it? Where it's hard to find good welders. Uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, again, thing about welding is it's an indoor trade. You know, one of the yeah. things about construction is, you know, you're dealing with the elements. So right now you're working in the heat, you know, and later on you're working in the rain, the cold, the snow, the wind. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, so as you get smarter and you get older, then you'll move indoors. <laughs> I will say uh, during this whole uh, COVID-19 thing that we found that, um, one of the main things that moves America is transportation and all the things that surround it. So, you know, everybody deemed what they thought was essential. I, I tell you what, I wasn't one of the guys that got to go to the lake and go fishing in a boat or something. I, I was still working while others like struggled to make ends meet. I don't say that lightly because that's, that's hard. That's hard on a family. That's hard on a person, but we didn't really slow down. We slowed down some, you know, as everybody kind of tried to find their footing as far as, you know, trucking companies and their freight and, us and where we're getting our supply or, you know, just what we're doing, but we were still moving. America was still moving. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's definitely some things I was thinking, uh, some of the guys in our new pathways program are working for SMC packaging. Well, I don't think we've, um, had less of a need for cardboard boxes. If anything, we've had a greater need for cardboard boxes and they're still working, which yeah. is great. So while Jim is fishing <laughs> at his resort, trying, trying to know. fish as I work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you guys say a little bit more about what are some of the, well, we talked a little bit about what some of the good things are um, and you could add to that, but what are also some of the challenges? I mean, one thing you've mentioned is that you could be financially pretty successful in this, but there are, you know, every career has its challenging moments. So what are some of the challenging things and, and like, what kind of characteristics do you need to have to be successful in that? Um, the, so the, I, I tell everybody that surrounds me, it's like transportation waste for no man or no woman. It's, it's 24 seven. My phone is on me 24 seven. Again, though, I've got, I have what I would call, or other people might call a servant's heart. I want to help. I want, I want to get that solution focused, you know, dealt or the solution figured out for the problem. But it, it's, it's stressful. It's, it's stressful in the family. I, I work most of the time, seven days a week, not full days on the weekends, but mm -hmm. to help other companies get to where they want to be and meet their goals, it's, it, it requires a lot. So um, you have to be diligent and, uh, at what you're doing and you don't have to necessarily be the best but you really got to try to help I mean. so when you're when you're worried about uh the success of other people that help makes that helps make you successful as well yeah but then just like if you were in the medical career or in any number of careers you know you're not always it's not just eight to five i'm thinking that's mm -hmm. true of anybody who's pretty successful it's not just eight to five Probably so. Yeah. <laughs> Jim? I think having a great work ethic, um, you know, I don't want to generalize or characterize terribly, but, but hiring young people, the, the first turn off for me is seeing them grab their cell phone and stand there and, and text for minutes on end. Uh, in fact, I've, a lot of times uh, when I'm hiring kids for the first uh, time, I just don't leave their phone in their car and go get it on your break. 
because you have to break the cycle of them constantly thinking they can look at that phone because you can't do any work if you're, yeah. if you're looking at your phone and talking on your phone all day, especially if you're doing manual labor or something like that. So respect that somebody, if you're an employee, respect that somebody's you know, paying you to do a job and you can't do it if you're texting your friends and all day long. Say that for your, your rate. You know, in, in the transportation business, just like Jeremiah said, you know, it's, it's an around the clock business. It's, it's, 24 seven, 365. And, and so you could, you could work hard. You, you just, you have to find that work life balance, turn it off sometimes and go, go, uh, be with your family. And, and so, uh, but I think every employer likes an employee that's, that's willing to, to give it their all, you know, give it a hundred percent, give it 110%. And, and if you're honest, I mean, that's a huge word, honesty in the job side, in the, in, in the workplace and in, in, in life. You know, if you have your integrity and you have honesty and you work hard, people know that. They see that and they'll respect that. And, and be patient and you will, you know, you will grow within an organization. So, Bo, I don't know about you, Jeremiah, but I know that anybody who's successful long enough is usually has other people they have to manage. Whether you're successful in sales and you have other people who are under you or Jim, certainly, you know, you're hiring people. Can you guys talk about that a little bit? Because anybody who's starting out now may, and eventually, especially if they're a business owner, they're going to have to hire people and supervise people. You want to talk about that? Because, I mean, that personally, I was thinking I never wanted to be responsible for anybody's work beyond my own because I knew myself that I didn't want to have to make, you know, supervise other people. Clearly, I'm way beyond that now, but there was a moment in time where I was worried about that. So, um, I don't really have to uh, manage anyone per se. Um, I'm kind of like the intermediary between the um, the shop and or our company and and then the the trucking company or fleet manager that I'm working with um, I do I one Bob Heifel uh, my, my boss he said uh, one of the first things he said to me was you're, you're the promise maker so we need the shop or our service to be our promise keeper and that's a hard thing so I've I've learned to um, work out some pretty interesting logistics to get things done, I guess. <laughs> not necessarily their boss or their supervisor, so it's like a totally different, not totally different, but it's kind of, it's a different dynamic, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a pinched place to be in sometimes, I guess. Yeah, I can see that. Managing people is always, is tough. You know, and it's, I've been doing it all my life and, it's, and it never gets easier. <laughs> but I, I think one of the things you have to do is learn to delegate and and so i'd come into the office and i'd want four things done in the day and and really you have to say i want four things done and not be a micromanager and don't hover don't say i want it done one two three four just at the end of the day if four things are done i don't care if it's one four three two or one two three four or four three two one just show me four things are done at the end of the day and i'll leave you alone um and I think that's that's a tough thing for a lot of managers that want to micromanage, uh, you know, like a helicopter parent type type you know environment. So um, hovering over the top, I, I've never been that way. Um, you have to trust people. You have to allow them to uh, do the job to the best of their ability. And is it going to be a hundred percent or one hundred ten percent? And is it going to be perfect every time? No, we're people. We're human. We make mistakes. We have accidents. Um, you know, we make decisions and they're wrong. We just have to move on. Can we learn from that incident and then move, up, move on in life and, and in our career and, and learn from that mistake? Because none of us are perfect. Uh, 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 being a, a manager, self-taught personnel manager, I mean, I can tell you I've made every mistake in the book. Uh, but I will still go back to trusting people every single time. Yeah. That's, that's the basis of you have to allow people to, to do their job. And, you know, are you disappointed? Oh, yeah, you are. Some days you are okay. disappointed. But you just have to figure out if that was an intentional act or if it was just beyond their capabilities or just, you know, uh, were, they, were they just deceiving you or, or were they really doing their best and they just don't have the ability? Or are they a superstar and they, they exceed your expectations all the time? So um, what would you have told your 17-year-old self? 
So if you could go back, if you could talk to yourself when you were 17 now, what would you tell your 17 year old self? Uh, you know, the easy answer would be yeah, don't spend all the money on, um, on the degree, but I can't really say that it's, I've come in contact with many, many awesome people worked with many families and marriages and helped them along the way. So I can't really say that. I think I would just say, be open, be flexible um, to life mm -hmm. in general, generally speaking. Cause it'll really get you down if you let it eat at you. That's, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and limit yourself to how much news you watch. I think, you know. <laughs> Yeah. It's my right. personal thing right now. Don't watch that all the time. That is <laughs> not good for you. Have to switch to NPR to get a, a better perspective. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> a different perspective. Let's put it that way. Yeah. All right, so, Jim. I, I concentrated on on the proficiency and the technical side, probably of learning a job and wanting to know how to do that job well and, and knowing the technical aspects. And I probably would say my biggest shortcoming as a 17 year old or whatever was not developing, uh, not spending more time developing relationships with people in the organization, maybe. Um, you know, I'm just still today, I'm just like a pinball. I just bounce around super fast and, and never slow down. You know, we'll be carrying on a conversation and my wife and I will be, and I'll just, you know, walk away from her, just because not intentional, but it's just who I am, what I do. I just, I'm on to the next thing. So I don't know that they diagnosed ADHD when I was a child. But <laughs> <laughs> Me neither, man. <laughs> so maybe there was some of that, so. <laughs> Any parting words, any last words, either one of you, uh, encouraging people to consider the trades or something that maybe is not college degree related? Although both of you have a college degree, but you're not working necessarily in the area where you thought you would be working. Well, I was on the 11-year plan. I don't know, you know, <laughs> I... <laughs> First of all, college are great. They're great years, but never, I would, I would have never thought of taking a loan out to go to school. So I worked, and when I ran out of money, I quit school for a semester or two, and then I worked for a while, and then I went back to school, saved some money, and went back to school for a semester or three, and, and you know, took me a while to, to, to get through. But, and as I did that, my major changed three different times. You know, I thought I wanted to go into wildlife and be a forest ranger, and then you know, get into education for a little bit. And then finally I said, you know what, you really like business and you need to get a business degree. And, but I wasn't, I wasn't uh, able to sit down and grind out an accounting degree. So I had to switch to finance because that was, anybody can get one of those degrees. <laughs> Just, uh, I will tell you, don't put yourself in debt in college to, to think you're going to come out with a great career unless it's, you know, unless you're gonna get a medical degree or some sort of thing that's just absolutely guaranteed. But, uh, you know, a psychology degree or a sociology degree and, and debt just don't work together, do they, John? <laughs> I did not go into, into debt for my degree, so let me just say that, nor did my parents, so. <laughs> Jeremiah, you got any parting words? Um. If you are going to get a degree, make sure you're flexible on where you can go and what markets you can go into. Uh, that helped that held me up some. That was my own fault. But uh, just be flexible. I mean, it's life is going life is going to hit you. It's going to come all different directions at many different times in your life. Just be happy where you're at and with what you're doing, and make sure that you're helping yourself meet it going. If you do get into management. Um, like Jim said, you know, don't uh, don't micromanage people. Be more of a, a leader. I, I see Jim more as a, a leader uh, of people. Um, and I think that really speaks to uh, who he is and what he's done with his life. Um, maybe um, looking back behind you, and if you see someone to have a you know needs a helping hand, help them up. Uh, I, th I think that builds uh, character for that person and yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Yes. Jim, Jeremiah.
We appreciate it. Always nice talking to you guys. Yeah. Great to see you, Jake. You. Take care. Thank you for having us. Bye. Bye.